Hi, Norman. Welcome to Movie Junk. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you? Doing well, doing well. I'm extremely excited to welcome Norman B. Golden II, who fans of the hit 90s comedy film know as Devin Butler uh, from Cop and a Half. You also play a young Danny Glover in Gone Fishing. You're also in the Moby Dick series and many other projects as well. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Oh, no problem, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course, thank you. And the fan in me wants to jump right into Cop and a Half, but I'd hate myself if I didn't ask kind of how it all started for you. I know that Cop and a Half, I believe, was your first uh, feature film, but how did it all start for you and how did you get into the business? Yeah, so uh, yeah, Cop and a Half was my, I guess you could say my first notable um, appearance. Um, funny story, you know, I was like three years old and around three years old. And so my uh, family or my my mom's uncle, which would have been my great uncle. So I would spend times in, in the summer, you know, in the Midwest. And um, uh, my family's originally from Wisconsin. So I would go back and, you know, he owned a barbershop. So I would, you know, spend time there and, you know, with some of the other family members. But I was always this precocious kid who, you know, loved to like make up skits and, you know, just joke around with, you know, the clients and all that stuff. So, you know, my uncle was one of these guys who, you know, he's, he is funny because he wasn't that like, um, and rest his soul because he's not here with us anymore, but like, he wasn't that fond of children, but like, for some reason I was just his, like, like I was his, his, his dude. So, you know, he'd like encourage me to, you know, make up these skits and, whatnot so um, I actually had a, another uncle one of my uh, dad's brothers would do the same thing so it, long story short I just kind of you know gathered I guess you could say uh, an interest or a knack for you know um, you know being pretty theatrical and just kind of using my imagination to you know create these uh, these scenarios and so uh, my initial like, I guess you could say that was my initial like interest when I started showing interest in you yeah. know wanting to be an actor. So I, you know, would nag my parents and say, "Hey, listen, you know, I would see kids on, you know, various television shows, and and I would say, hey, you know, like I, I want to do that. I can do that. And of course, you know, my parents, you know, and I'm I'm very grateful for them because they never uh, never said like, oh, don't you can't do it or you know do it when you get older. They would always encourage, like, yeah, you know, you can do anything that you put your mind to. And I tell anyone, disclaimer, like if you tell a child that you can put, they can do anything that they put their mind to, <laughs> you, be careful because it just might manifest because that's actually what happened with me. So I, you know, I kept, um, you know, I kept like kind of nagging them. And I guess it could be by the stroke of luck. My auntie um, was having a conversation with uh, my mom and, you know, my mom was basically, you know, sharing with her how, you know, like I've been kind of nagging them about, you know, wanting to be an actor and being commercials and TV shows and stuff. And it just so happened that her son, um, who's now, he's grown up, he's like, he's got a, you know, his own uh, acting career, very proud of him, he's, he's doing his thing. Um, so she had gotten him into some uh, commercial workshops. And so she, you know, told my mom about, because my mom at first was like, well, you know, I don't think that's going to work out. Because at the time, my family didn't live in LA. We were relocated due to my dad's job um, for a year. So we were in uh, North Carolina okay. at the time when all this was kind of happening. So, uh, but fortunately, my both of my parents were in the airline industry. So this is the actual, the, the very interesting part of the story coming up. So after this conversation or during this conversation, my, uh, my mom was speaking to my auntie and you know, my auntie's like, well, yeah, you know, Norm is, he's, he's got the look, he's very precocious and he's, you know, he's intelligent, he's smart, like you should give it a try, at least put him, you know, enroll him in this, in this workshop. And then you can see if, you know, how he would, how he would do, because that's what the workshop was really designed to do is just to kind of see how the kids would react to, you know, the rigors of auditioning and, you know, taking direction and all the things that, you know, the industry demands of people. And if you're talking to kids, I mean, a lot of people have cute kids and they think their kids could be the next cute kid on TV, but it, it is work, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, my mom, I guess after some, a little bit of twisting, you know, Monty's like, you should really do it. So she enrolled me. And so now mind you, we lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, the workshops took place in you know out at this place called Burbank Studios it's no longer or Larrabee Studios it's no longer there it's in it was in Burbank though across the street from Universal uh, Studios so 
it was a two month program. So every Wednesday <laughs> I would, um, because of the time difference, we were able to work this out. So I could leave school, travel to LA, make the evening workshop, take a red eye, come back to Charlotte and then go to school on Thursday the next day. Cause a flight would land at around like five thirty, six o'clock. And then, you know, we would drive into the city and then I would go to school. So we did this for, um, I did this for about two months. And then, so after, excuse me, after, you know, everything was all said and done with the workshop, um, there were casting, there were two casting directors, uh, a couple of agents and a manager that were there and all of them wanted to sign me. So, that was pretty much my parents. Um, I guess they they took a leap of faith and said, okay, well, I guess we can, you know, let him try this. And one other part of the story, uh, interestingly enough, right after about a about three months after all of this kind of took place, um, my dad was able to actually put in a transfer because we he wanted to be back. He never wanted to mm-hmm. transfer, but just kind of got bumped because of you know semantics or whatever so shortly after all this happened he was able to put in a transfer to move back to LA so that I could be out here um you know to audition and whatnot so that's kind of the short of the long of how I how I how I got going and then as you can you know as they say the rest is history kind of and, and I gotta ask you know because with with your Instagram handle the golden child which is one of my all-time favorite movies with Eddie Murphy. Any early mm-hmm. aspirations to, uh, uh, was Eddie Murphy someone that you inspired or kind of grew up watching? I know uh, in the early 90s, I mean, we already had had, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, Golden Child, 48 Hours, another 48 Hours. Um, yeah. At that age, were you already watching any Eddie Murphy movies or? Well, interestingly, I I wasn't because my parents were like, you're not going to watch 48 Hours. <laughs> I was a child, so I, I didn't really get a chance to consume a lot of Eddie, Eddie Murphy's um, projects because they weren't, you know, kid friendly. Yeah. Um, I did know who he was. Um, my parents, you know, uncles, aunties, family, you know, they were fans. Yeah. Um, and I did actually get a lot of comparisons. Um, I was compared to him a lot, you know, the little Eddie Murphy. You can actually kind of Google some of this and go back and see where I think... Um, I don't know if it was Gene Siskel or Roger Ebert, one of those, one of those guys, I think they were, they actually made a comparison. So I, I don't know if it just kind of happened that way where I was kind of like a mini him, but it, yeah, it just, I, I, I never studied him or anything. I mean, until I got older and then, you know, of course I'm like, oh yeah, Eddie Murphy's that guy. He's, you know, he's a legend. So the so the timing, I mean, perspective, I mean, really early on, I mean, the audition for Kindergarten Cop comes about. And initially, I mean, this film was conceived as the the sequel to Kindergarten Cop until it was eventually kind of reworked. But from what I understood, there was over 4,000, you know, kids that auditioned. Um, you know, what was the audition process like? Yeah, so um, it actually, yeah, it was that that's correct. It was conceived as a you know, as a sequel uh, to Kindergarten Cop. Um, A little, few little known facts. Uh, It didn't really make it that far or have legs because I don't, some people actually may know this, but like Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't really do sequels. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's done the Terminator franchise because it's a franchise. I mean, there's, (laughs) there's a lot of that involved. And so he's like, okay, well, I guess I can do this, but he does, he's no, he normally doesn't really do sequels. Um, and so that was kind of out of the water and it, it, you know, the development process for cop and a half, it did really kind of take its own, um, its own path. Um, as far as, you know, speaking to the 3000 kids or the 4,000 kids, um, and it's interesting cause I, even now I get numbers, I, it's, you know, it, sometimes I hear 3000, I've read 3000, sometimes it's like, oh no, it's more like 4,000. So it's anywhere between three to 4,000 kids. Um, yeah, it was an open call, um, which actually happened because once Cop and it's amazing actually that Cop and Half was actually even, you know, it made it through the de- development phase and it was even made because there was a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, hurdles or, yeah, that, that kind of, you know, would have made it just 
kind of go away and wouldn't even go out get it, it wouldn't get out of development hell as as we could say in the industry um but yeah it was conceived as a sequel for kindergarten cop then once that didn't work it was it's standalone project they wanted to well, actually did not wanted to they actually had um other new little in fact they had um, macaulay calkin attached yeah. what happened with that was during that time i think he was because yeah because copenhagen came out in 92 so he yeah. was really yeah so he was really inundated with the home alone you know uh franchise and from a money standpoint the offer that came in for cop and a half was way under you know what um he was getting for home alone so they're like yeah no no thank you and plus the development process was so slow with cop and a half that you know his team was just like we're not gonna wait on this when we have this in the hand you know so it went from a, a, a vehicle for him and I forget I, at the moment I forget who the guy was it wasn't Burt Reynolds it wasn't even Burt Reynolds but it was some, some other person and so once Kurt Russell I'm sorry Kurt I, Russell. I, I feel like it may have been either Kurt Russell maybe Mel Gibson too one of those guys but um I know there was a couple of people that um passed on the project once you know um Culkin was out so then it became okay well we have a budget we have you know a producer on board um i think henry winker came on board as a director in the interim of all this stuff and so they're like okay we have no kid we have no cop <laughs> so we need a cop and a half so uh burt reynolds was doing evening shade at the time and he was looking for vehicles to get him back because he's a he was a movie star man as you know burt reynolds is you know he's he's legendary and you know the work that he did in you know the early to mid 70s and early 80s is kind of speaks for itself um so he was looking to kind of regain that that footing um cop and a half really wasn't gonna do it but it's you know it's a it's a path you know it's a path so he agreed to do it after a bunch of other people either dropped out or didn't um and then so it was like all all that was left was the kid so it was an open um open casting call so to speak so like a, at, at the time they called it cattle call but now it's just it's open casting because it's it's a little bit more um as you can say politically correct uh <laughs> so I had this open call and kids were coming in coming in just no one was uh right and it narrowed it down to um i get this number right 150 kids and that's when you know, uh, the rubber kind of began to meet the road because now you're talking about time in terms of the development phase, which at this point it had been quite a long time, you know, so Burt Reynolds was getting a little antsy, um, going back to what I was saying, he was doing a show called Evening Shade. So he's like, I want to do this movie, but I have this show that's paying the bills, that's keeping me relevant, but don't waste my time. Cause like, and then I got to do this show. I got to do this, this movie with this kid. I don't, you know, he never really worked with kids. He's like, what am I doing? <laughs> so actually at one point he was ready to walk but um one of his uh, associate producers or producers that had worked for his uh, production company at the time Elaine um, Elaine Hall was her name at the time um she's like well you know you're like the very last choice before they show this movie so that kind of got to his ego a little bit and so he's like okay I'll do it <laughs> I can use the money and yeah whatever that actually makes sense. That probably played into his character, why he was so grumpy. Yeah. That probably yeah. made his performance a lot better, I'd imagine. Yeah, because he really, he, you know, Cop and a Half wasn't something that he really was, like, super excited to do, but he did it because it was it was a vehicle, you know. Um, but now this is where it comes, again, the, where the rubber meets the road, because after, you know, 150 kids were kind of narrowed down from thousands, right, um, I was a part of the, that 150 uh, batch. Then, you know, you start weeding those out. So it got it got down to six kids. Um, and at the time, they were concerned about, you know, the kids being able to work with such an established artist, actor as Burt Reynolds. I mean, this dude has done, you know, stunts and he's, you know, kind of, you know, he's not a actor that has worked with kids so they really needed to see how the chemistry was gonna 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 work so they ordered a screen test which would entail the kid go on 
film with Bert and do you know these monologues or whatever or uh, not not I'm sorry not monologues but these various scenes yeah. uh, so it was narrowed down to the final six and I was a part of that it was two kids from New York two from Chicago one from Chicago one from Dallas I think and two from LA I was one of the kids from LA I was actually the second to last kid to to um to screen to test with him um and it was on different days so I was actually testing with another kid who was from New York on the day that I went in and uh you know as you know as the story has it you know I did the did the start doing the 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 um the scene and you know Bert's like ad libbing he's going off off paper and he's coming back on the book and I'm following him everywhere and he's just like I can't lose this kid and he's like and he's good and he's like convincing that he's like a little cop this is amazing so he literally you know after my audition with him he's like I, if I'm gonna do this movie it's got to be with this kid otherwise you know like I, I am ready to walk <laughs> you know so that that kind of is how that happened and another interesting thing I had actually gone on three auditions for cop and a half um i did the initial audition then i got a call back and after the call back um there were other people in the casting department that were like yeah he's too small there's stunts because i was a very short kid and sm kind of small kid you know for my age um i mean i was what seven eight at the time i looked like i was six <laughs> so they were like they're concerned about that and you know other little tidbits or whatever but there was this one casting director I think she was actually a casting assistant or associate at the time and she's like you guys have to keep this kid in the running because he actually has what this film is going to need trust me on this so um they decided to bring me back for an additional callback before they ordered the um the screen test for me yeah so yeah, I was going to say too, and and, and just kind of touching back because um, you mentioned the comparisons to uh, to Eddie Murphy. I think mm -hmm. it might have to do with the buddy cop because Forty Eight Hours was still fresh, and another Forty Eight yeah. Hours had just come out. So mm -hmm. I because because Burt Reynolds kind of does have that Nick Nolte type of persona. Uh, yeah. So I think that's where some of the comparison might come from. And then also, too, I mean, and this is just a credit to how well you did in the movie. Uh, I mean, you definitely any time that you were on the screen, I mean, you stole the show. Right. <laughs> to be able to because you were also a better cop than Burt Reynolds in, in most of the scenes. Right, You were helping him out. Yeah. And I think it wasn't. I mean, at this time, it was probably um, the um, Home Alone film an empire of the sun where we really have a kid that's stealing the show right up to this yeah. point. So yeah. um, to kind of see that, I mean, that was just unbelievable. And that's just all credit to your performance. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, and that was, you know, in that, in that era, you're absolutely right. I mean, that was uh, kind of the thing, you know, when you look at, you know, another 48 hours was, that came out in 90 so it was a couple years before uh or three years before cop and half actually was released we filmed in 92 yeah um, so yeah there was a series of films and i mean even with kindergarten cop to a lesser extent you know, i mean you had and it was it was either buddy cop or you know it was buddy cop fish out of water or buddy cop fish out of water you know like with kindergarten cop it had that buddy cop fish out of water where you know he's like this rough and tumble cop who now has to be you know a kindergarten teacher yeah. so same same with with Burt Reynolds where buddy cops this situation where he's used to you know and he says in, the, in one of the scenes like you know you <laughs> I can't have any fun with a kid you take a kid to a bar he has one drink he falls off the stool that's amazing <laughs> or I hate to run I hate to run yeah now one now one question that I mean it just hit me in my mind too. I mean this was directed by the Fonz, Henry. Mm -hmm. What was it like being directed by the Fonz himself? Oh boy, um, that that was an adventure for me. You know, I and this is all retrospect or hindsight because, you know, that was really my first, 
I guess you could say major experience with working with a director that extensively. Um, so I didn't have anything really to compare it to until after the fact, but, you know, Henry Winkler was a very, um, he's very meticulous about certain things, but you could tell that, you know, directing, I guess you could say maybe that particular genre of film or that particular, just maybe it was just the particular film itself. He, he was challenged with. Um, there were a lot of things, and that's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, in hindsight, when you look at like, okay, directors and how they do certain things, like I think it was, you know, he he like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm ready, I'm suit up. But then it was a little bit more than what he probably had expected. And the reason why I say that is, you know, with Burt Reynolds, you know, he had been, you know, in a director's chair for a few times in his career, as well as, you know, the leading man. So he was very well versed in, you know, a lot of things that should have, you know, happened. Um, but, and actually, I say this to say, you know, the two of them actually kind of butt heads a lot, you know. Um, but I, I have to say, you know, Burt Reynolds never, you know, he always allowed, Henry Winkler the respect that he deserved as a director on a film but it was it was at times where it's like okay <laughs> I can see he's kind of getting his footing but overall you know I, I don't have negative things to say at Henry for, with Henry Winkler at all I mean in fact um he was very uh what can I how can I say um understanding and uh, like gracious with the fact that he had a kid working on the set. So, you know, he would impose things like, well, you know, as far as work hours, like we don't want you to drink sodas and eat candy because we can't have you flying off the handle <laughs> when we need to have, you know, to get work done. Um, but he was also very uh, protective. And I mean, he has, he had kids of his own. So, you know, he's yeah. like, we want to make sure that this kid is taken care of. He's in, you know, he's in a sea of adults. And yes, yeah, you know, my, of course, my parents were there. So they were, you know, definitely on their job as well. But it just kind of added that extra um, little layer of protection, if you will. Because, you know, shit happens with kids, you know, quite a bit on sets and in, in the industry, unfortunately. But for me, fortunately, I never had to really worry about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, and again, not just saying it because I have you on as a guest. One of my most favorite and funniest scenes that just always cracks me up when I watch is the Frank Severo scene when he's stuck on the boat, and, <laughs> and even if the whole, all the credits go by, and yeah, and he's still hanging yeah. on the boat. To this day, there's not one scene that I can watch continuously. That doesn't make me laugh as as strong as as that. But what was it like? I mean, you were working with. I mean, you were going up against the mob essentially, right? But what was it like working uh, with these guys and Frank Severo um, in particular? Yeah, Frank Severo. Um, I love, love, love Frank Severo. I mean, honestly, every everybody on you know in the cast of Cop and a Half um, was very gracious to me. Um, again, I was like one of the only kids you had the kid who um was my friend yeah. um sanchez. but he sanchez yeah um but you know i was you know the regular so as far as work i you know i was kind of the only kid and you know he was um yeah frank was very cool very and it's so interesting because he was he's really humble and you know as i got older you know and i started really getting into you know cinema and you know, the history of things and like knowing that he was in like the Godfather and all that, like, you know, to have the honor to work with, you know, someone like that is just like, you know, in retrospect, again, it's like, wow, that was, it was really great. And I had nothing, again, nothing but great things to say about uh, Frank. And also too, I mean, grandma, right? Ruby D. Oh, yeah. And Gangster, yeah. I mean, all the, the many films that, you know, she played, um, but again, any any stories you could share with uh, with working with her on set? Yeah, actually, um, you know, because I, I had I had a few famous grandmas and mothers 
you know, in my career. And, you know, she was one of those, one of, you know, a few of the, the famous grandmas that um, I really felt as if she was, you know, grandma. in fact, I actually, by the end of um, shooting, you know, it was uh, Grandma D. That's what myself and my sisters, because I have two sisters, or two older sisters, that's what we, you know, um, started calling her. Um, funny story or touching story, actually, now to look back on it. Um, so during some downtime, you know, on set, you know, we were at the, um, the studio well, actually the the all, all of the interior shots were shot at a at a school at an abandoned or not an, a, a closed school abandoned school or whatever so they took classrooms and made them into you know like uh our our dressing rooms are private areas so they would put you know they put you know sofas and the the um the carpeting down and made it look like like a little mini apartment. It was interesting how they how they did that. It was great. So anyway, we were hanging out in my um, my dressing room, <laughs> and um, you know, just watching TV, just kind of hanging out, waiting for you know the next uh, setup. And so she comes in, and she's just like talking with my mom and dad, and we're all just hanging out. And so my sisters are there, and my elder sister was braiding my middle sister's hair. And so she, um, you know, she came over and she's like, oh, oh, honey, honey, honey child, let me show you a little, little trick. And so of course <laughs> my sisters, well, especially my older sister, because, you know, she, my older sister, she's a playwright and she's a writer. And so she, she knew very well who, you know, Ruby D was from, you know, raising the sun and all these other things. So she's just like, huh, you want to show me, you know? So she went on and she's just talking and like, you know, it actually kind of, it, it gets me a little bit because she was carrying on with us as if we were actually her grandchildren. And it wasn't anything that was forced. It was just, I want to spend time with this family, you yeah. know? And um, I just, I think that's one memory that I will, I will always uh, cherish. She actually invited us to a concert because um, she knew the whining, the whining singer, BB and CC Wines very well. So they had a concert in Orlando um, one of the weekends that we were off. So we went up there and another funny story. So I was excited to meet them because my parents had listened to their music and, you know, I kind of knew who they were because of them. So I'm like, oh, wow, like, man, I'm meeting some famous people. <laughs> and so she she was there and she looked at them and they kind of smiled and they were like, he doesn't quite understand, like, he's a famous person or he will be a famous person once he pieces but they they were so um they were so uh i guess you could say like taken aback or you know they chuckled that i was just so you know a kid precocious and just like excited to be in that that particular um setting but you know i again i can't say you know anything negative nothing but nice you know nice things nothing but um authentic real things about um you know grandma d as I called her. I mean, she plays the the mother and grandmother role like so perfectly in all of her films. Yeah. And like, you know, she can be like any of our moms, any of our grandmas, right? Like she's such a sweetheart. And yeah, I mean, she, to me, I mean, I think at that age, when I was a kid, I think that was the first movie that I probably uh, saw her in. And every time that I would see her after that, I was like, oh man, that's, that's Grandma D. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now I know with, with Cop and a Half, I mean, the film opened up number one um mm -hmm. well. i think even for the first three weeks it was one of the top films um but i mean what was it like i mean now that like did you know while you were making the movie that maybe you were doing something special or is that just impossible to uh especially at that age but what was it like kind of like once the movie came out what was the impact of that yeah at that age especially um well that, that's a twofold thing for me um because i i you know I wanted to be an actor because it's fun and I enjoyed the craft. And it's one thing that, you know, I always said that if I could do it, even without getting paid, I would do it because it's just something that I'd love to do. And that's when you know you're on your on the path for you, because what's the saying, you know, do what you love and the money will follow. Um, it doesn't always quite work like that in the industry, but, you know, that's 
you know, it is what it is. And it's, you know, and it ain't what it ain't. But, um, uh, you know, I would say I didn't really know too much about that. And, and I, that's, that's probably a good thing because I was still able to be present to why I was doing what I was doing and not let it go to my head. Like, Oh, I, I've got the number one movie. It's like, okay, it's doing well. I mean, I knew that it was, it was doing well just because of the demand for interviews and interactions. And of course, you know, the agents were calling you know, at the time, my mom, um, mom and dad were my manager so you know they were getting phone calls for you know meetings and offers and all this kind of stuff so you know things started to kind of take a little bit of a different trajectory as far as my career um I became a little busier but for me it was just it, I was having a blast you know and I think that that's um you know for anyone that's aspiring to to do that kind of work you know just keep it fun keep it light because the minute it's not fun or light then you're not you know personally it's not for the right reason it's just you know fame and fortune it's it's fleeting and it'll if, if you're not careful you know it could it can mess with you so if you don't if you're not doing it for that if you're keeping the the um the spontaneity and the authenticity in your craft, in your work. And it's difficult to do when you, again, because it's show business. So it is a business and the business, there are things you have to adhere to, but as far as the craft, like keep it fresh. Yeah. You know, and that's what I was able to do in the midst of, you know, all that stuff, partly because of my personality and also because, you know, I was a kid, which worked for me at that time. Yeah. Is there is there still um, anyone because you're still you know an, an actor, but is there still someone that you're hoping to uh, work with, uh, whether it's a filmmaker or an actor actress that you still have on your bucket list? Oh my God, yeah, man. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I yeah, I'll just I'll name some folks. Um, you know, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Denzel Washington, Samuel Jackson. I, you know, if I if I could do a, a short film with that man just for free or whatever, just to be like, I I was able to do a short with Sam yeah. Jackson. Yeah. Um, Don Cheadle, yeah. uh, Angela Bassett. Um, oh, my God. I, I'm got a brain fart she was aaron brockovich julia she roberts also, julia roberts i mean like you know these are these are beasts as far as i'm concerned uh john legazamo um yeah. uh the guy who was um gosh i'm, I'm getting brain farts in, in these names um what was the movie he he, he played uh um is a show gus free oh um and um Juan yeah, Esposito, uh Juan Gian Esposito. Um I just met him. Yeah, Giancarlo, Giancarlo. Giancarlo, Giancarlo. Yeah, yeah, I just met Giancarlo. him last year. I'm sorry? Yeah, actually I just met him uh, last year at the uh, Sopranos Con Comic Con in uh, Atlantic City. Super nice guy. Super nice wow. guy. Yeah, he's 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 also a beast with his craft. I mean, I loved what he did with the role of Gus Fring. I mean, very believable. It's interesting because if I ever met him, <laughs> I probably would be like, be scared. <laughs> he he's I mean also too. I mean, he's such a like he can do any role. I mean, he's also yeah. part of the Star Wars universe too. Yeah, so, yeah. and also I, I loved him and uh, Ali. He played Ali's father. Um, mm -hmm. He was also Malcolm X too. You know, he's yeah. a gangster in uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. I mean, like, yeah. he can literally do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's, man, there, I mean, I, I know for sure I'm leaving some people off, but just <clears throat> what comes to mind, like, yeah, I, I definitely, I, oh, um, I can't, I can't, I gotta, I gotta mention her just because she did come back, come to mind. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Sandra Bullock. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, She's yeah, she's amazing. Um, yeah, man. There's 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 a bunch of people that I would I would definitely love to work with. Do you do you also have a passion for creating your own projects? Do you screenwrite at all, or um, also have a passion for maybe filmmaking as well? Or 
I do actually. Um, I have produced a couple of uh, short films. Um, I did, did them kind of in the style of a, as, as proof of concepts because I have, um, I'm a writer and I've been, I've been writing, I've actually been writing since 99. So I've been writing for quite some time, um, about 20, 20 some odd years. Um, and that was just a natural extension to, you know, wanting to delve into these characters that were written for me. But I'm like, well, wait a minute, why don't I create my own characters? Or why don't I create? And then I realized I was okay, creating characters is like creating worlds, creating stories and learning how all that stuff, you know, worked together. Um, yeah. So I began, you know, writing and just kind of creating my own things. So but I do have two, uh, two projects there that are on um, Amazon Prime. Um, one is called uh, Misreception, and that is really dealing with the. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a different lens, you know, on, you know, the police brutality situation. Um, one of my first cousins is a cop, um, or he's a detective now for uh, the city of Milwaukee, and that was that that project actually was spawned out of a conversation that I was having with him and his brother, who was also one of my, um, he's my, they're both my first cousins, but uh, his older brother who, who's done a lot of work with Marvel. He was on the, actually on the, um, the new what kind of forever film. Oh yeah. Um, at, yeah. He was a second AC, I believe on that uh, camera, camera in the camera department. Um, so he's been doing a bunch of, you know, Marvel films, got a contract with them, I believe. Um, and so we've, started to develop some things our one of the first projects was uh misperception um because and as a result of that you know my my cousin his younger brother was you know kind of telling us a lot of what's actually happening you know it was, it was weird because it's like kind of it's like wire style you know like the, the, the show the wire so we're just yep. like listening, listening to what actually really happens and he's like you know it's not you know, we're, we're in the midst of all of this, you know, um, I guess you can say race baiting and all that kind of stuff. And then, and don't want, I don't want to say race baiting because actually, you know, it is, unfortunately racism is, you know, it's a thing. And, you know, I, I really feel like it, it doesn't have to be, but, you know, the way everyone's kind of like going about it, it, it just unfortunately is a thing, but, um, there's also a lot of intricacies in just human behavior, period you know, that I think, you know, whether you're black, white, Asian, whatever we miss, which is why racism persists to be a thing. Um, but I don't want to, that's just, <laughs> I'm going on a rabbit hole on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so my cousin is saying, you know, like even within our community, you know, he's had to deal with, um, you know, as a cop wanting to protect and serve and that being his, his, his dream and his mission and his goal. Uh, has been difficult to do because the the community is in such a place, and when I say the community, the black community is in such a place where, um, you know, the trust that we have, whether it's a black cop or not, it's just like you're a cop, you're mm, because we know what what happened. I know what happened to my cousin who, you know, got in the squad car. We thought he was going to jail, but then we got word that he was found dead in a dumpster two two blocks away and the the last person the last people we saw him with were cops you know so shit like that is happening so the reason why that film was called misperception is because there is a real misperception when it when it comes to things that you know are it's it's a heated debate it's a it's a you know it's um it's kind of uh it's not something that you really want to talk to but it's talk about a lot, but it's not necessarily what one may think, because there's always two sides to a story, two sides to a coin. And, you know, humanism is what we really, you know, that's like the running theme yeah. of that particular project. It's like, it's not about, you know, it really isn't about black, white, this, that, whatever, class, because we all create, we as humans, we create that. So we can create something if we want to, you know, so that's that. And then I have um, another project uh, called Hollywood Kid, which um, is basically uh, a commentary on my my experiences as you know a filmmaker, writer, screenwriter, you know former child actor, uh, challenged with 
you know, creating a name for myself as an adult in the industry, you know, and the pitfalls and the, the comical and somewhat not, and sometimes non-comical uh, situations that, you know, I'm, I'm faced with as it pertains to just, you know, life in general and even the industry. Now, I know they um, kind of back to the cop and a half uh, part, they did make a sequel direct <laughs> DVD. Uh, yeah. But if they ever came up to you to make a theatrical release on a on a true sequel with bringing your character back, would you be open to returning? I would. I would be. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would. I would definitely do it for the fans. Um, it wouldn't be. It, yeah, that I, I just. I, if I'm honest with you, it would be, it would be for the fans. Um, I would definitely have, have fun with it because I had a lot of I had a lot of fun filming Cop and Half. You know, as a kid, I had lots of fond memories. Um, that was, you know, I got a a, a really big um, like crash course in film. Even though I was so young, but that you know, kids they soak up a lot. You know, so from that experience. You know, it's actually one of the reasons why I'm still, you know, interested in, 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 you know, moving forward with, you know, my uh, career as a writer and even actor, you know. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely do it for the fans, because I know when you mentioned that um, the the sequel to Cop and Ava, I think it was it called like Moon Recruit or something. Um, I kind of felt bad for because <laughs> I know my the fans that were like diehard cop and a half fans are like oh my god they're doing this it sucks it's crap it's just like okay but it's still a film and you know like if they were talking about the other kid i'm like give her a shot you know she's you know like just it's i understand your your allegiance to the original film because you know a lot of times it you know i would get like why didn't they ask you to make a cameo and this now i'm like well you know that's that's the part of that's the business of show you know what i'm yeah. saying these things happen where they're, you know, they didn't, they didn't ask me for whatever reason. Um, and I probably would have if they had asked me, but they didn't. So, you know, and they made it, I guess it was a completely new storyline from what I understand. I've never seen it, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, but to answer your question, yeah, I would, I would do it for the fans for sure. That, that would be awesome. And yeah, I mean, this was right around the same time where uh, in kindergarten cop two direct to uh, DVD came out as well too, I believe with Dolph Lundgren. Mm -hmm. So kind of right yeah. around the same timing. But yeah, I think it would be great to see a true sequel where, you know, the tables are turned where now you're a cop, you know, maybe even paying respect to the late Burt Reynolds, or maybe he's retired and you're kind of taken over and you get something like a similar situation. Or maybe it's even your son who's a fast talking uh, kid as well. <laughs> almost to feel like his dad, but yeah, yeah, that would be exciting to, uh, to see. And I think the, uh, the fans would uh, probably be more favorable seeing the original star return. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of, a lot of my fans were saying. They were like, it just would have made sense. You know, um, I even had one guy who's like, you know, from a dollar and cents perspective, like, you know, if the cop and a half, the original cop and a half was number one film, you know, for three weeks, like, wouldn't it make sense to bring, you know, the kid who's still very much alive, you know, and doing his thing back to that, you would, I think the audience base would have been a little bigger because people were, would be waiting. They'd be like, Oh man, I'm gonna see it. Cause like, I remember the kid, you know, when he was, you know, back in the day. So, yeah. And um, I always love to ask, you know, our guests, you know, whenever you guys are not working, what are the shows that you guys are binge watching uh, today? So whenever you guys are kind of like taking the step back and being the fan, you know, what are you watching? When you're not working. Ooh. Um, Wow, a lot. <laughs> well, you know, when time permits, when I am watching, you know, I it. Let's see. Um, and now, you know, because I'm I'm married now. I have a beautiful wife, beautiful daughter. She's six months old. Um, I think I may have mentioned that to you in a side right. note was setting this up. Um, so there's a lot of things that actually my wife has been interesting uh introducing me to or you know we've been watching together um on my own i have it because you know I'm, my schedule doesn't really permit me to like sit down and binge watch because i'm pretty busy uh doing things but um let's see what what are we so we've watched uh we've been watching a lot of docuseries so we did the killer sally about the bodybuilder i just saw um, that just saw yeah. that one yeah, we did that one. Um, we did the, the Dahmer one, which was 
That was kind of tough to watch. Was just, yeah, it was tough to watch because just because a lot of all the stuff that's that was surrounding it, and then you know the um, the controversy with Ryan Murphy, you know him supposedly not you know reaching out to the families, but then he said that he did and all that stuff. But just the content itself was just like wow, you know. Um, Apparently, it so- got renewed for uh, two more seasons, so we're gonna get um some other uh, potential serial killers as well they kind of teased the uh john wayne gacy at the, on the episode the last yeah one. yeah i and you know what i think that's the one that they're probably going to go with because gacy and G- gacy and uh Dahmer, if you look at they're like kind of two sides of the same coin like well at and at the end of their lives you know how what happened what happened to them once they were captured like you know gacy was like he maintained his innocence, even though like the the evidence was overwhelmingly against him. But he's like, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> and he's like sitting there holding a foot. <laughs> no, I didn't chop this foot. You know, that was his thing. And then he's, you know, his last words, kiss my ass. And where you had Dahmer was like flip side of that, where he's like, oh, yeah, I did every bit of it. And I'm, you know, shameful, blah, 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 blah. But just to see, it is kind of, it, it's slightly fascinating though to see the, the inner workings of the mind and how two people could do such heinous things to people, yet there's two different types of approaches to it, you know? Um, that's interesting. But yeah, I did hear about that they were going to do that. So it's interesting to see what, um, who they'll, who they'll uh, profile next. I think it may be Gacy. Um, so... We actually, speaking of Ryan Murphy, there was another, uh, The Watcher. Yeah. That's been renewed for another season as well. Um, we just binge watched that um, it was the last couple weekends ago. Um, yeah, and then we've been kind of getting into some some films, but I'm drawing, a, I'm, excuse me, but I'm like kind of drawing a blank on some of these things we've been watching. But it's been, it's been interesting just to kind of see what's coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, both like with all the streamers, but specifically Netflix and Hulu. Um, we've been getting a little bit into the Prime shows as well. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, interesting, interesting things. Excellent, excellent. And, you know, we can't let you sneak out. You know, given the uh, the Thanksgiving theme, and hopefully we can air this before uh, tomorrow. But uh, any Thanksgiving plans that you have uh, playing with the fam, or anything exciting that you have going this week? Um. Yeah, actually, I'm excited uh, because this is, you know, my first Thanksgiving that I'm actually spending just with my, like with my own family, my wife and, you know, I have an infant daughter, but, you know, usually, you know, we do the, you know, trek up to um, my auntie, she lives in a couple city, well, she lives in Lancaster, which is a little bit out um, uh, north, it's like 70, 80 miles north of LA, and she's, she's got a really nice house and that's like that's been the the gathering place for years um we all just kind of go there or you know we'll go to my mom's place and you know do that so now we're just gonna kind of you know start a tradition where you know we're gonna cook and it'll be easy for us because you know it's just two of us and the baby so we'll cook a little bit and have some leftovers and you know watch some films and tv shows and just kind of enjoy each other's company and then um you know for thanksgiving that's that's what we just kind of decided to do. We're excited for that. You know, Christmas is another story. Obviously, we have a whole thing planned for family and New Year's and all that stuff. But Thanksgiving, we're just gonna kind of kind of hang out and you know, just us. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's an exciting time, obviously, with a uh, a new uh, baby as well. So new traditions are going to be created. Yeah. Uh, Definitely, I think it'll be exciting, you know, once uh, when she's old enough, you can watch uh, Cop and a Half and kind of have that childhood kind of <laughs> invigorated as well, too. But yeah, you, yeah. if you told the uh, the kid version of me that one day I'd be sitting with uh, with the actual, you know, Devin Butler, I'd say you're crazy. Um, so definitely it was a, it was an honor to uh, to sit down and kind of talk movie shop as well as discussing one of my all time favorite uh, comedies as well, too. But just want to thank you for uh, for joining Norman and uh, uh, can't wait to share with the fans. Oh, no doubt, man. My pleasure. I always love to um, talk movies and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, fulfill a dream of yours or anyone else's like that's that's, you know, that's that's cool. Excellent. excellent. And again, if there ever is a talk of a, a true cop and a half sequel, we definitely got to bring you back for for round two. 
No doubt, for sure. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, have happy Thanksgiving as well. And uh, looking forward to talking soon. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you. Happy holidays. You. Take care.